Uh, my name is Nadav Cohen. I work at Netflix. Uh, I do mostly developer tooling and Nebula, which is our collection of open source plugins for Gradle. And I also wrote uh, Groovy Cones, which is an open source project that's used to kind of learn Groovy from very basic building blocks up until really advanced language features. And yeah, I'm Rodrigo de Oliveira. I work with Gradle. I'm the project lead on the Kotlin DSL project. Right. So obviously, you were both big fans of you know both Groovy and Kotlin. And in this session, we hope to show you the difference between the Groovy DSL and the Kotlin DSL and how you can leverage Kotlin to make for a, a much better, much more pleasant uh, development experience with Gradle. All right? Um, and before we start, um, how many people saw Jake's talk on Kotlin? OK, oh, wow, quite a few. All right, great. So he had a set of slides where he was basically <laughs> Uh, complaining about the complexity of, of the, the Groovy DSL and you know all the crazy things that Groovy does. So we're going dive, to dive very deep into that. We're going to see exactly what goes under the hood there and basically con contrast that with Kotlin. Okay. Uh, how many people have experimented with the Kotlin DSL? Oh, wow. So more than a few. All right, cool. So before we dive into the code, and most of the session is about code, uh, I just want to review a couple of uh, a couple of language features in Groovy that make it what it is, right? So when we look at a normal Gradle build in Groovy, I mean, it's, it's pretty standard, right? We apply, can you see my cursor? Great. We apply uh, in the Java plugin, we set a couple of properties, we set a single binary repository, we have a single compile time dependency. It all looks very simple, right? Um, but it doesn't actually look like a Groovy script, right? I mean, we can take this and just put it in the Groovy console and hope it would work, right? There's a lot of magic that goes on here behind the scenes. And let's look at the different things that Groovy does that make this happen. First of all, when you have a method um, that has at least a single parameter, then the parentheses are optional, right? In this case, we have a single parameter. Groovy actually sees it, <coughs> sees it with um, parentheses. Simple enough. Second thing, we have the concept of named parameters in Groovy. What this means is that you can basically tell Groovy, hey, I want this parameter named key to be of value, of value, value, right? And the way this works in Groovy is that this gets implicitly converted to a map. Uh, or, and basically, as long as the, the method signature supports this, you can do named uh, arguments or named parameters. Uh, closures are first-class citizens. This is a really important concept in the context of um, Gradle because closures are really just um, blocks of code that accept parameters that can be passed around from, from method to method, right? And the, the thing that invokes the closure uh, has the ability to manipulate it in very interesting ways, and we'll talk about those ways in just a bit. But I think the important thing to highlight here is that this all happens at runtime, okay? So in this example, we basically have a, a closure or a piece of functionality that prints hello to some name. And then we have some other method uh, that takes in a name and invokes the closure with that name. So we could, in this case, we're invoking it with be friendly. But in theory, we could invoke it with be obnoxious or something like that. We can basically change the implementation by passing a different closure. Okay. Um, and for readability, uh, Groovy allows you to basically do inline closures. So you don't have to define it outside the method. You can actually do it inside the method. And even going further, you can actually put it outside the parentheses to improve the readability even further. And we see this very, very often in Gradle DSL. Gradle Groovy DSL, I should say. Uh, before, I mentioned that when you run closures, you can manipulate them in very interesting ways. This is one of those ways. When, if you change the delegate of a closure, what that basically means is you can change what this or the this keyword means in that closure when it runs. So what the closure ends up being executed against can be manipulated at runtime. And we'll see an example of how that works in Gradle as well, a couple of examples. And finally, and perhaps the most confusing, is that um, in Groovy, you can do meta programming. You can basically invoke methods and properties that don't actually exist, were not uh, defined statically, 
But then, uh, based on the method name that was called and the arguments that were passed to that method, you can still react. Uh, and you do this in Groovy by implementing a method missing. Okay? So in this case, uh, Groovy would call method missing method that doesn't exist. Okay? That's it. Uh, that's all the slides I have. Let's go straight to demos. OK, so this is a regular Groovy uh, DSL. And we now know that parentheses are optional. So this is actually using parentheses. And we also know that uh, named parameters are actually a map. The other thing we know is that delegates are, uh, can be manipulated, right? So this apply thing actually calls project. Does everyone see the code, by the way? Is that big enough? Yeah? Thank you. Um, and if we go into the, to the project uh, class, we actually see that we do have the apply method in here that accepts a map. This is the map that gets converted from the key value we saw before, right, from the plugin Java. Uh, same thing applies to source compatibility and target compatibility, except if we dive into here, um, ah, if we dive into here, we're not going to see it. And the reason is, and this is again, mm -hmm. once, once again, the magic of the Groovy in runtime. Um, basically, when <coughs> Groovy sees, or sorry, when Gradle sees a property that it doesn't recognize, what it does is it goes to all the plugins that have been applied and asks, hey, uh, do you know what to do with this uh, invocation? Is that something that you want to configure? Uh, and in this case, we're uh, using something that's called Java plugin convention, right? So the Java plugin. Uh, basically uh, defines the Java plugin convention and says, these are the things I support. And at runtime, again, uh, Gradle is able to accommodate and basically set those. If we didn't have Java applied, we could still you know, call these as far as Gradle is concerned, because that all happens at runtime. Okay. Repositories, again, uh, is another method. Oops. Is another method on uh, project. And in this case, it's a method that accepts a closure. And at runtime, what happens in this closure, and I know this from the API documentation, that this keyword gets changed to a repository handler. Okay? Uh, we can visualize it much easier if we do this. This is a pretty common um, Gradle idiom. So effectively, this is what repo handler. So effectively, this is what happens. And if we dive into repository handler, we see we actually have this as a method here. Okay. Uh, same thing for dependencies. Again, with a caveat. Dependency handler. With the caveat that in dependency handler, we don't actually have a compile method. Again, this happens at runtime. What Gradle actually does here is um, it goes at runtime to check, do I have a configuration named compile? And if yes, it just runs dependency, dependency handler dot add compile with this, right? So this is just, uh, I guess, some sugar around the API that makes it more readable. Uh, but in effect, a lot of stuff happens. And lastly here, I mean, this doesn't even look like Groovy at all, right? What happens here is an AST transformation. Uh, Gradle takes the code as it is and converts it to something that the API understand, understands. Uh, this actually been, is being translated to project uh, task. <coughs> Hello. So this is a string value for the task name. Do last, then. And if we dive into the code again, we see that this is indeed uh, some, a method on the API. So this is actually what happens. <coughs> OK? Any questions on this, by the way? Feel free to ask. All right. So let's see how Kotlin does it. Uh, first of all, in Kotlin, we have um, a plugin block, but the plugin block does not accept a closure. What it accepts is a lambda, which is similar in concept to closure, uh, but it's statically defined. It means I'm always going to accept nothing, and I'm always going to I'm always going to return nothing, 
but I'm going to execute on this, this guy right here. And I know this statically. I don't have to wait for runtime uh, to find this out. And, and because I have static access to this, what I, I can do, which is pretty cool, is I have a ID access to all the plugins that are available with the distribution. Um, application, for example, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, what actually happens here, and I think maybe Rodrigo will talk about this more later, is that uh, these uh, extension functions <coughs> are defined when the distribution is created. So we know, again, at compilation time, or at build time, uh, what's available. Now that we've applied the Java plugin, this extension method for Java is made available. We can do source compatibility, and we could do the same for target. And you see I have full IDE completion. Uh, this is because this does not happen at runtime anymore. This happens strictly during build time. Right? I can dive into this. I see this is uh, another extension function that operates against the Java plugin convention, and this is all uh, strongly typed. Okay. Repositories, very similar. It um, runs against the Lambda with a, a receiver as repository handler. We have the same for dependencies. Everything available statically. Um, compile. And then task, I'm just going to use the, uh, the regular API call for now. And that's it. Uh, and if you look at it when it's complete, you basically realize this is almost identically, almost identical to the Groovy variant, except here everything is strongly typed, right? Uh, you could effectively take the Groovy script as is, almost, and convert it to Kotlin and continue to work as is, just with all the benefits that you get from Kotlin. Um, let's review what we had here. Basically, first of all, we have full IDE support for what plugins are available with the <coughs> distribution which is great. You don't have to guess anymore. Um, extension definitions like Java that we saw don't happen in runtime anymore. There's no Java uh, plugin convention that you know Gradle needs to do at runtime. This is all available as you build in the IDE. Um, and I didn't show this, but if I were to remove the, the application of the Java plugin, then the, the, Java extent, the Java configuration extension would just turn red because uh, Kotlin would be able to tell me, or Gradle would be able to tell me, that this doesn't exist anymore. And finally now, I mean, we can just dive into the API, into the source code, and, and know exactly what the Lambda is going to be executed against. And we no longer have to rely on documentation, and in some cases, that's not always available, right? If it's, not, if it's a community plugin, then sometimes we just don't have documentation and we have to guess. This is a big plus. All right. Um, let's go to the next. Let's go to the next demo. Let's talk about tasks. So we saw how to define tasks in Groovy. We do task, and and this is uh, colored here in yellow or orange, I guess, um, because again the the ID doesn't actually recognize this. This is not actual Gradle API. What actually happens is an AST transformation that turns it into something else completely. But uh, now we know this. And we also know how to do dependencies right, uh, between tasks. We have a world task here that depends on hello and prints world. So basically, when I call world, I'm going to see hello world. Uh, and I also have, in this example here, something that we call a task rule. Uh, what this does, basically, is it allows you to accept uh, a pattern of, of tasks. In this case, I'm basically accepting hello something, and then I output to the screen to the screen uh, a personalized greeting based on the the task name, right? Uh, and I do this by depending on hello from before. And the way this works in in the Groovy DSL is using a closure again, and again just by the the documentation. I see that this closure specifically expects a single parameter of a string type, which is the, the task name. Uh, there is no other way for me to know this other than running it or reading the documentation. And that's, that's something that you see throughout Groovy uh, DSLs. OK, let's see what, how Kotlin does it. <coughs> 
So we saw the plugin block, we know how that works. Uh, and then in Kotlin, we basically define tasks. We can define them either using the regular groovy way, like we did in the first demo, or we can do it this way. And when we use the by keyword, what we basically get is an identifier. We no longer refer to tasks as a string. Uh, this is now an identifier that we can later manipulate, and we'll see this in just a bit. Um, and in here, I have the world task that, again, creates it using the Kotlin way, but it depends on the same identifier that we have from before. If I change this to hello2, IntelliJ would complain straight away. This doesn't make sense. You don't have that identifier. I can even you know, do more. I could refactor it. I don't know if you can see. Uh, I can refactor it to hello there, right? And it would do the right thing, because it's an IDE. It knows how to work with code. It works seamlessly. Um, and one more thing that's very interesting here is because it's all strongly typed, I have full um, com code completion here as well, right? I have do first. I, could, I have pretty much code completion for everything. OK? This is, again, something that you sometimes have in Groovy, depending on the context, but not always. It's not, uh, not always a smooth experience. Um, the other thing that we have in here is that you can also instantiate more, um, more specific tasks, right? In, in this case, I'm instantiating copy. Uh, and when I do this, again, it's strongly typed. I have access to all the different properties that come only from copy are not available in the standard task. One more thing that I almost forgot to mention is that because this is an identifier, you can just hit F1, and you get the documentation. I don't know if you can see this. And you get the documentation from the identifier that we have at the top. In Kotlin, we do documentation in Markdown, which is already much better than what we had before. Um, so there's that, which is really useful, especially in cases where you know there are tasks that you're not super familiar with and you want to learn more. Just you know, hit F1, and you get more context. And in Kotlin, just like in Groovy, you also have the same access to the API for editing rules. But in this case, we're not using a closure because this is not Groovy. We're using an action of type string. This is what they call a SAM, or a, a single abstract method. Uh, and what happens in Kotlin is um, this gets executed with this being the value of uh, the string here, in this case. So we basically get the task name as this. Uh, and we have the exact same logic, except in here we use some Kotlin-specific uh, utilities that are very useful. All right, uh, so that's the second demo. I hope it wasn't too quick. Let's review what we have in this. So we were able to refactor the task names, right? We could just hit, uh, I think, Command-Shift-F6. And you know we could just rename it across the entire project. It's no longer a string. It's no longer just dependent on whatever you have in runtime. It's all statically typed. Uh, second, we have full IDE support for all the different properties and members that tasks <coughs> offer you. Uh, this is great for discoverability. You don't have to go back and forth you know, with the API documentation. It just works as you'd expect. Um, we have strongly typed dependencies. Uh, if I, for whatever reason, I mistyped and I, I changed the name of my task, I now, I now get a warning in my IDE instead of you know, shipping it off to the CI and finding out there. And then we also have docs because those are actual objects, actual identifiers, which is also pretty neat. All right, that's it. Any questions about this? OK, all right. Thanks, Nav. So I would like to talk a bit about this um, very prevalent uh, Gradle pattern, like the domain object collections, right? So, but before I delve into the demo, I think it's interesting to, oh, see, it's missing the invokes lines. Oh. So. Is it, is it in the get? Mm -hmm. But it's okay. Demo three. So this is a Groovy file, right? And here we have two of these domain object collections, right? We have the configurations, which is the collection of configurations you define in your project. Right? 
And we have tasks, which is also another type of domain object collection, right? So domain object collections are, are like these observable collections. You probably interacted with many of them, right? Like you can say when added, when removed, that kind of thing, right? And they also provide the service of being like configurable using this block syntax, a more declarative looking syntax, right? But what, what we can see here in Groovy is that configurations can actually be configured just by invoking, right, the configurations collection, so to speak, right? Tasks, however, cannot be configured the same way. We require this call, right, to the configure method. Reality. So we have these two like model elements, configurations and tasks, but they have different APIs on how to be configured. Right? So that's the, the first observation. Let's see how that looks in Kotlin. So again, we have configurations, which is a domain object collection. And it's in fact a named domain object container, but there's a deep hierarchy there, and it's a named domain object collection in the end. And we can, we can configure in a very similar way, except that this time we have to be very explicit about a few things. So if something is dynamic, like I'm adding or configuring a dynamic element of a collection, something that is not available at build time, I actually have to be very explicit about, about using a string to configure it. Right? So that's a, a signal that this is a dynamic element I'm adding to, to R. Uh, configuring for my collection. And that's another aspect, right, that, um, that is shared with Groovy with this particular syntax, like the dynamic syntax. It will create the element if it's not there. So but just by looking at this, you don't know if this code is creating a new configuration or if it's actually just configuring an existing configuration, right? And then for tasks, again, tasks is a task container, which in the end is also a named domain object container, which is a named domain object collection, right? And again, we can use the same invocation syntax. This time I'm using a different way of, of creating elements, the more explicit way that Nadav already demoed, right? But I'm doing now using the block syntax, the more de declarative one, right? And I do that by creating a new task here and when I use the by creating and by reading that way, I can be sure this is, ex is an explicitly uh, created element, right? And so this would fail if, had, if the element is already there, right? So I'm being very explicit. And again, I can create an element there. I can open a new block to configure the, my, my domain object collection again, and this time I'm just getting elements from the collection. And again, by being very explicit here, I can be sure this code will fail if the elements are not there, right? So this is a very explicit approach. And of course, just like we saw with configurations, we can also use the dynamic model just passing strings, right? So this all works. And the, the enabler, right, for this type of DSL construction in Kotlin is actually the ability to overload the invocation, like the invoke operator itself. So Kotlin does allow uh, opera uh, operators to be overloaded, right? A few of them anyway. And we use this pattern a lot throughout the Kotlin DSL, overloading the evoke operator, right? So you can, and we are invo uh, overloading the invoke operator on string, right? And so we receive again a lambda that will run the specific block against the, the, this element called this here that I'm also invoking, right? 
So let's take a look at the power-ups that we can get by moving to Kotlin from Groovy, right? First, we have a uniform configuration pattern, right? For free, because we overload the operator, the invoke operator for every domain object collection, right? So we don't get into that situation, oh, I have a domain object collection here, it's the test. Should I call configure? Should I not call configure? Basically, every domain object collection is treated the same by the Kotlin DSL. And the second one is that I have this explicit collection operation semantics, right? I, I know for sure that I'm creating an element, I'm accessing an existing element, and I don't get in the situation, well, what's going on here, right? Or going to funky situations, like trying to configure a task that has not been created yet, so then you create with the wrong type. If you ever had that type of problem with Groovy, this, this power-up is the solution. So now um, I would like to talk a bit more about the extensions and conventions that we've been seeing. Right. So um, Gradle has this very dynamic model, right? Plugins can contribute to and can extend. And historically, the, the main configuration, uh, the main extensibility mechanism was something called conventions and conventional uh, properties, right? Uh, conventions can be uh, thought as types of mixings to the project. They add members to the project, right, directly to the project. And extensions, they actually extend the project by introducing new names, like new namespaces for those properties, instead of adding all the properties directly to the project. Let's see how that works, actually. So in Groovy, I have these two plugins applied, the Java plugin and the Maven publish, publish plugin, and they are both contributing to the project model, except that Java uses the convention mechanism to extend the project model, right? And the Maven publish plugin uses the publishing, uh, the, uh, the extension mechanism so it introduces the publishing extension, right? So the Java plugin added this Java plugin convention, but we don't see it in the DSL. The properties just appear out of nowhere there, right? And so if you have many conventions, you can imagine, right? You can have name conflicts, that kind of thing. The extension mechanism is uh, more well-behaved in that sense, right? Because it's just a single name that is introduced, like, as a namespace to all those properties, right? But you can see that in Groovy, you have to be aware of these distinctions. Oh, so where this property is coming? Oh, it's a convention, so it's directly in the project. Oh, no, it's an extension, I have to add this block. So there's this cognitive overhead, right, to it. In Kotlin, however, Again, the same script translated to Kotlin, right? The Java plugin, the Maven Publish plugin. But this time, both the conventions and the extensions share a single mechanism, right? This namespace mechanism. So I know if I want to configure the Java plugin, I use the Java extension. So we can think now in the Kotlin DSL of this convention and extensions in a single unified way, right? They are all extensions, and I, I use them the same way, right? And in fact, like, just like Nadav mentioned, right, we get one more benefit here in Kotlin, and if we wait long enough, <laughs> we get feedback from the IDE saying that actually this extension does not exist, right, because there's no plugin contributing such a thing as a Java extension. Right. So the power-ups we get from this is the uniform access, right? So now we can think in a unified way about this conventions and extensions. And in fact, that's very useful because conventions will be deprecated very soon, 
the preferred mechanism will be extensions and conventions will disappear. So by using the Kotlin DSL, you get to, to live in that world today, right? And you get this feedback at altering time instead of runtime, yeah? Yeah, uh, because Maven dash publish is not a valid Kotlin identifier, right? Kotlin has this back tick syntax that lets you apply like literal identifiers. So it's like a coded identifier. No, because uh, in the underlying model, conventions are actually named, right? So the, the plugin author has control over, over the internal name, and, and now with the Kotlin DSL is also the exposed name. So yes, plugin authors have control of the names, but you cannot remap. I, I mean, theoretically, we can envision that you could write a plugin and you could apply that plugin, and that plug plugin could, you know, expose existing conventions under new names, and then you get to do some sort of name mapping. That would be possible, right? You're asking that because you want to avoid name collisions, right? Name collisions or, or name confusion if an existing convention has an ugly internal name. I see. Okay, or if two extensions from two different plugins have to have the same name, So now that we, yeah, sorry. That, that problem has not been raised. Yeah, uh, so plugin authors have control of the convention names. They, what, what might happen that is really applicable to, like directly applicable to the Kotlin DSL is that, let's say that name is not representable as a Kotlin identifier at all, not even with backticks. Right? You could have an extension like that, right? And so what the Kotlin DSL does is that it actually hides such extensions and you'd have to use the API to, to do that. About the problem uh, of collisions or bad names, so again, you could write a plugin that can be applied in the, in the plugins block that would you know, move conventions around, but not rename them. I, I can imagine you would be able to remove the convention from the, its, its original name and then add it under a new name. So that would be possible. You know, but there's no built-in mechanism to do that. Like you would have to write the code. Yeah. Yeah. One thing you can do is if you have name conflicts. Uh, I think if I remember correctly, the first one wins. And so you don't have direct access to the other ones. It's an extension, but there is an API to actually get the convention by name. Yeah. And you can always add a new convention. So you could grab an existing convention and add it under a new name of your choosing. So you could do that. So now that we've seen a few demos, right, and we've been comparing like Groovy and Kotlin code, right, uh, it's important that uh, I say that Groovy and Kotlin can happily coexist in the same build, right? So you can have Groovy build files and you can have Kotlin build files. You can apply one from the other. At will, you can apply a Groovy file from a Kotlin file. You can apply a Kotlin file from a Groovy file, right? So they happily coexist. But there are a few challenges. Uh, I'm going to take a pause for a moment uh, of talking specifically about Groovy. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a few challenges with the Kotlin DSL. They are related to Groovy. And they're related to the fact that we have a thousand plus plugins right out there, and they all being written in a pre Kotlin era, right? They might have groovisms just because Groovy was the 
default language and it has these useful patterns. So there, there are a few challenges there, right? Dealing with these APIs, these legacy APIs developed in this pre-Kotlin world, right? Uh, the first challenge, right, is APIs that were specifically meant to make the groovy, uh, like the groovy DSL look nice or nicer. When I, talk about, when I talked about domain object collections, right, we, we saw that this, um, the groovy doesn't have this built-in support to make all collections automatically configurable using the invocation block. So what happens is that it's very common, right, for plugins such as our own made in published plugin, right, to add these configuration methods. So you see we have two things that from the Kotlin point of view are called publications. We have the get publications method that gets translated into the publications property that actually returns the publication container, which is the domain ob object collection we are interested in. But because, it, because Groovy doesn't have, like the Groovy DSL doesn't have this automatic, right, ability to configure any collection, it's very common that APIs also include a publications method. And then when you're gonna use that, when you're gonna use that, how do I go back to the code? Go Is back to the line? previous location? Yeah. Keyboards. Yeah. And developers with uh, different choices. <laughs> <laughs> so because we have these two, right, mappings for the same name, publications, Kotlin has to resolve the name, right, using the, the, the available heuristics and the, the, the one that wins here is that if I'm passing an argument like a lambda expression to this identifier, it must be a function because I'm passing a lambda to that. So in this case, publications is resolved to a function. And that function, as we saw, right? Oh, I, I got in trouble again. <laughs> So, and, and that function takes an action, right, to configure a publication. Now let's go back a bit and see what we get from the other one, right? So by using this, uh, I guess I can call it idiom, if you let me. So we, by using like the almost ear muffing idiom, right? We can disambiguate the situation, and now Kotlin has to resolve this identifier as a single expression. It has to make makes sense, right, on its own. So it can only be a property, right, because I'm accessing a value, so it must be a property. And now I'm actually invoking that property. And so I get that invoke overload at this point, right? And the reason why, you know, those two mechanisms are not equivalent is that because the invoke overload actually runs that block of code un under this augmented named domain object container called the named domain object container scope, which adds a few more, you know, goodness to the domain uh, object container API, including, right, as we saw before, and I have to go back to the code. <laughs> Thank you, Nadal. <laughs> Too many fingers, sorry. I cannot understand yeah. the chord you're playing there. <laughs> <laughs> and here, we're, again, we are using that invoke overloaded on the string. And that invoke overload is only available under that specific name it domain object container scope, the augmented scope with the improved API. So that's the reason. And that's a challenge. But now you are equipped to deal with the challenge if you find it in the wild, right? So the next challenge is groove interoperability. It can get very ugly, depending, right, on, on 
how far, right, in the metaprogramming, you know, outer space people, you know, travel. So what I'm going to present here is actually like a boss level challenge, right, of groove interoperability. And it, it's a real one. We actually had that exact challenge in our own build script. Oops. So there's this uh, Cone JFrog Artifactory plugin. It's one plugin that was written right against the the Groovy DSL, the Groovy Gradle API. So it makes use of many Groovisms, right? So, such as like dynamic uh, runtime metaprogramming and all that. So in the Groovy version, right, we can configure such a, can, can everyone read this yeah, on the back? It's okay. So it looks like just as you would expect. I can set a property, context URL, and I can configure all the published settings by invoking this publish method, right? passing a closure and I get new closures and all is good because in Groovy I can just use closures and pass closures around and it's all good. If you want to use that same right, plugin now from Kotlin, we have to deal with the fact that that pl plugin is actually expecting groove clo Groovy closures. So because that plugin was written not to you to, to use the action, you know, SAM interface provided by Gradle, but instead it preferred to use the Groovy interface or the, the, the Groove closure interface. And so you see there are a few things happening here. The first one is we no longer, we are no longer able to just use the property syntax here, right? Instead of like context URL receives some value we are forced to use set context URL. The good thing at this point is at least, right, so, oops. We still have code completion, and then if you say context, you get there, right, you see. So, yeah. so the issue is that there's no getter, right, for the context URL property. Yeah, so if we go to the source code, and we can go to the source code of plugins, as you may know by now, we can see that we, we have this uh, set context URL, but there's no get context URL. And in Kotlin right now, there's no such a thing as write only properties, right? So if you have a setter without a getter, it's just a function, it's not a property, right? This can also happen when the setter and the getter don't agree on the type. So if the setter expects an object and the getter returns a URL, as you would expect maybe from this method, Kotlin also won't think that as a property. So you might run into that issue, right? Command brackets. Out of time. Thanks. Now the, the, the very interesting part, if interesting is the right word, is that when we invoke publish, right, we see that it actually expects a closure. So we have to somehow in Kotlin, right, synthesize this, this closure to give to the, the plugin. And by looking at the code, we can see that this closure will execute, will run against this publisher config. So in Kotlin, you can use, we have a few primitives for Groovy inter interoperability. One of those is the delegate closure off, right? And delegate closure off is basically an adapter. It adapts any Kotlin function to a Groovy closure with the, 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 the caveat that the argument will be whatever the closure delegate is set to, right? So there's a bit of, of understanding the plugin, what it's doing, if it expects like a delegate or the argument, but by navigating to the source code, you usually can figure it out, right? And just to mention one more, more, more thing, right? We have this very in interesting case again here, 
where we actually have to create a delegate against a groovy object. Simply because, again, by navigating to the source code, we see that there's no like, strong, stronger type to use. There's nothing like a real data object or a value object, nothing, right? There's this double delegate wrapper. And if I go there, it, it, it's, it's nothing, right? It doesn't have, it just have this groovy stuff like invoke method, property missing, and all that, right? So in that case, we, are, we have to resort to just say, oh, it's a delegate. It takes a groovy object, and I'm going to use the groovy reflection API to set properties, to invoke methods, and so on. But it works, right? And that's the, the important point. And so now we were equip, equipped to deal with that problem as well. That problem, I should mention, only exists because this particular plugin chose to use closure instead of the action type, right? That, that is not a problem of being a groovy plugin. Groovy plugins are all fine and they will interoperate with Kotlin just fine. It's just that particular choice of using closure instead of action that makes this harder. So that's what we had for you today. I hope it was informative. So any questions before we leave? Yeah, I, I would hope so. I would hope that things like um, closure versus action, those things are very low hanging fruit, right? And, and I would hope plugging authors with pressure from plugging users, right? And, and all the benefits you can get from the Kotlin DSL will make that happen in time. Yeah? You, just, you might want to mention that especially in 4.0 release, Gradle itself has made huge strides in doing exactly what you just said. Yeah. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. Yeah, so a, a big part of the effort, right, in, in creating the Kotlin DSL and making, you know, pleasant to use was to also upgrade the, the Gradle APIs to, to match the expectations of the Kotlin compiler. Yeah, Mom. Yeah, and, and one thing about your question about how to make plugin authors adapt. Mm -hmm. um, we plan to add some linking for Gradle types, validates, for example, the, that the, the getter and setters for properties have types that match, and yeah, things like that. So be warnings, of course. Yeah. Ethan? Yeah, we already we already have that. Yeah, we have actually a few plugins that are built in to make very easy to use the Kotlin that we ship. So for instance, we have the embedded Kotlin plugin. So if you apply the embedded Kotlin plugin to any project, right, what you get is basically the Kotlin version that ships with, with Gradle. You get like the compiler, the standard libraries and all that. And we have the Kotlin DSL plugin, which goes a bit further than that and actually also applies the same plugins that we use to make the DSL look nicer, like making sure action maps to these Kotlin types with the receiver and all that. More questions? On here? So with the roadmap of 4142, 4, 3, can you speak over what you're expecting in the conference of the things that are being pushed out? Yeah, what I can say is that we, we, we're going to release the, the Kotlin DSL version that we've been demoed here with 4.1. Right. And we, we, we think that's very close to 1.0, but as we said in the other talk, there's still work to do, especially with regards to documentation and all that. So I cannot give you a specific time frame, but I can say that we are you know, in, the, in the sprint now to make it, and we hope to make it very soon. Do you mean linting, linting groovy build scripts? Yeah, groovy build scripts to, you know, to clearly identify problem areas that can be or should be fixed. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting point. There, there, there is a Gradle linked plugin 
and I think it'll be interesting to, to improve that plugin to, to have that, those features. Right? Okay. I think we ran out, yeah, out of time, so that's all the time left. Thank you, everyone. Bye.